we end our discussion of metallic materials uh, in our FCC, BCC, and uh, FCC, BCC, and simple cubic structures, and we get into kind of the structure of fun materials, which is non-crystal materials, polymers, liquids, glasses, gas, and liquid crystals. Um, there are definitely materials and elements that uh, will have more than one crystal structure. Uh, and these, we refer to these materials as polymorphs or allotropes. So um, in elemental solids, this is called allotropy. You might have heard that uh, previously. So um, you're probably, actually nowadays, you're definitely not holding one, but when we were in person, you definitely were probably holding uh, one polymorphic material, carbon. So carbon can exist in multiple different structures, diamond, graphite, fluorine, graphene, iron can be BCC and FCC. We've talked about titanium being HCP and PCC, and we're gonna also look at lead titanate, PB. O3, which can be tetragonal and cubic structures as well. Although it's a perovskite, anyways, uh, there's a little bit more details. So that's just kind of an, uh, if you hear the term polymorph or allotrope, you now know what it's about in material science. So we can exist in these different kind of structures. Um, so, so far, the whole kind of, actually this entire lecture has been focused on crisp, purely crystal materials. Um, really because why, as we kind of stated at the beginning, they're the simplest materials to work with. So they have short range order, long range order, long range orientational order, and long range translational order. But there are lots of materials, specifically polymers, liquids, glasses, liquid crystals, many other materials that do not exhibit, uh, at least uh, to the extent that metals and other crystal materials, ceramics, ionic crystals do, this degree of long-range order, long-range translational order. So they will have short-range order, and they'll have some degree of long-range orientational order and long-range translational order. Um, so again, some of these, but not, typically not both, again, uh, due to the periodic nature of these crystal materials. So how do we, and again, often you'll hear um, them called random material or disordered materials. No, 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 that's not a good kind of idea. Non-crystal materials, amorphous materials are the better term. So how are we going to kind of identify or measure or describe kind of the order or lack thereof of these kind of amorphous or polymer or glasses or liquid crystals, liquids? How are we going to kind of describe the structure of these materials? Well, we're going to use this dimensionless uh, pair distribution function, a PDF or a radial distribution function. Um, Called, also be called a paracorrelation function. Um, very, very confusing, I know. Uh, but this is going to be our key descriptor to quantify the short range order in, a in uh, these amorphous uh, or these non crystal materials, these polymer liquid classes. So the PDF or RDF is governed by this equation below here. I know, looks pretty nasty. Um, but key thing is here is we're taking, we're normalizing by the average particle density and we're counting basically the number of particles n in some kind of spherical shell or radius um, that grows as a function of essentially this volume of the shell. So uh, the best way to kind of take a peek at this or kind of try to understand it conceptually is by looking at this kind of figure. So actually, let's go ahead and let's take a peek at this. So I've kind of made this figure myself. So the way that the pair distribution function works is you pick a reference atom like this one right here. And what you do after that is you start to kind of draw these shells. So these shells with increasing radius. So you can see here right now, because my G of R, remember, the G of R is basically counting the number of atoms being hit by this you know, increasing radius, this shell. So initially, I'm not seeing anything, right? I'm not counting the number of atoms, and I'm not dividing by the volume of, this, of your shell. So I see nothing, I see nothing, until finally I hit a radius that's large enough, an R distance, distance R away, where now I'm intersecting, I'm hitting some atoms, and you see a spike. You see a spike occur, because there's kind of, and then this spike occurs because, again, we're counting the number of atoms. And when you see a spike, it's because there's this kind of characteristic distance, right? Some distance R, where, at this distance R away, I'm hitting these atoms. This should be very reminiscent of a metal, right? You can kind of imagine what we're going to see if we draw the PDF for a metal. So let me draw this here, and then draw one more line here. So if I chose this as my reference atom, let me draw one more. So let's say I drew, drew so let me draw one more line here, sorry. Let's say I drew this as my reference atom here. So I would reach a distance where first I'd hit 
my nearest neighbors, right? Then I'd hit my next nearest neighbors. And then I'd hit my next nearest neighbor, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You get the kind of the point at this point, yeah. So you draw these circles and you get these characteristic spikes. For a metal, your PDF or your G of R would look very similar to your, uh, actually, you can kind of see the difference or uh, very similarities. Intensity versus two theta for metal, we see this kind of peaks, right? G of R for a metal, you'd see this types of peaks. Because we're hitting all or nothing, right? I'm drawing circles and then I either hit something or I hit nothing. So it's a little bit different for this kind of disordered material, right? Because as I keep drawing, then there's going to be some other shells where I hit some, but then not, you know, there's some degree, right? There's some bonding here where this atom is going to be coordinated by a certain number of atoms. But then after that, it gets kind of a little diffused because you're kind of wiggling around. But you can see, again, there's this next shell, and you see another peak. And then eventually, this peak will die off, and you'll kind of flatline it, and everything will kind of look the same. And you do this procedure for every single atom, and you choose that as a reference, and you average all these together. So it's very, very complex. But you can do it. So the when you're looking at these PDFs and RDFs, is that, again, it's this kind of Basically, it's kind of describing our the, the degree of our short-range order and long-range order. Um, so you can kind of see very uh, distinct differences depending on the material that you're working with. So we've already kind of said that this is a metal. What type of structure is this? Well, it's basically saying everything is looking flat. And you can imagine if you have gas particles that are just kind of running around kind of randomly, that as you pick an atom, everything's going to look the same. So this is a gas. And in here, this can be a liquid, this can be a polymer, and this can be a uh, you know any amorphous material, amorphous metal, or metallic glass. So when we're looking at these peaks, again, the intensities don't matter you know, as much as at this point. But why are the peaks wider here? Well, again, it's because here in the you know, we have this perfect lattice, right? So either we're, again, we're either getting a signal or we're getting nothing. But this is more broad because, again, for a polymer, it's kind of more like spaghetti, right? Like, I know where the, each of these monomer units are going to be, but then I don't necessarily know where that's going to be. So when you average over, these peaks kind of widen. So if the peaks are wider, that indicates, again, less long-range orientational translational order. But the number of these peaks, if I have more numbers of peaks and for longer distances, that means I have increased long range orientational order or translational order as well. So that's the key point when you're analyzing these PDFs and RDFs. Uh, and the other thing is you can even get further information into these peaks. Um, so for example, uh, if you integrate, if I integrate your peak for the first peak, for example, I can figure out the integral of the peak is going to give me the number of nearest neighbors. Because again, that's what we're doing essentially in this PDF and RDF. We're counting the number you know, of atoms that we're hitting in the shell. So if I ever integrate this peak, that's going to give me the number of nearest neighbors, my first number of nearest neighbors. This, if I integrated this peak, it would be my second number of nearest neighbors, my second coordination shell, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can start to imagine I'm going to give you several problems where you're going to have to kind of work uh, with uh, looking at these different metals and figuring out these values. So remember, you can kind of integrate this and get to those values. So for example, for a metal, let's say I gave a problem, like one in your problem set perhaps. Let's say I told you that, uh, here we go. Let's say I said I integrated this peak. So I said, I've integrated and I said that integral, integral equals 12. Well, what structure, what cubic structure has 12 nearest neighbors? That's FCC. So now I know that this first nearest neighbor distance is always 2R. I know the second nearest neighbor distance is 2 root 2R. So if I gave you this value, I know these next, uh, at least, you know, if I, if I know the integral, I now know what this position should be and this, should, this, this position should be, the second peak should be, in terms of R. So you could be given one of those values. Alternatively, if you're given this, that this spacing was 2R and 2 root 2R, I know that it's either FCC or, now the one thing you want to be careful of is simple cubic also has this structure. If this was BCC, 
this would also be, so this is for simple cubic 2r, 2, 2r, bcc is 2r, and then this is also for bcc, actually it is going to be 4r over square root of 3. So, and again, for fcc, the integral of that first peak is going to be 12. The integral of that first peak for simple cubic is going to be 6, and then bcc is 8. So again, you can kind of imagine, I'm going to give you some problem where you have to look up the structure, figure out these different distances, and then figure out on the periodic table what's the atomic radii. It doesn't make sense. So uh, I might post an example video kind of to help you out on that one just because I'm so nice. Um, but anyways, uh, in the next video, if people uh, would like, I would definitely be happy to talk about uh, liquid crystals. But again, that's going to be beyond the scope of this class. But you could see a similar type of director vector. But this is this orientational parameter S. So you might see that uh, kind of coming up. Uh, or actually, it's very similar again. Uh, this kind of instead of translational order here, liquid crystals have orientational order. So this director vector where they kind of align their orientation. Um, and you can kind of see this transition. So it's pretty cool. Uh, but anyways, we can kind of talk about that. But again, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this class. Make sure you know these PDFs and RDS. Those are definitely going to come up. So uh, with that, that's pretty much all there is for lecture two. So next time we're going to get into lecture three, and we're going to start to talk about defects. So uh, crystals are like people. It's the defects in them which make them interesting. I love that quote. So we'll get into that next time. Thanks, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye.